Political parties in America have been at war over abortion for decades. More voters than ever before say that their vote in the 2020 presidential election will hinge on abortion. The abortion debate has been one of the most contentious aspects of American politics. It's even more polarized now, really, than it's ever been. When you choose to abort, you're choosing to kill yourself. Around a quarter of American women will have an abortion. It's an intensely emotive moral issue across the world. But only in America has it divided politics so deeply. You can take the baby and rip the baby out of the womb of the mother. It's not okay with me. It is her body, it is her right, it is her decision. Dr. Colleen McNicholas is about to provide testimony in a case that could close the state of Missouri's last surviving abortion clinic. With this trial here this week, we are fighting for our right to be able to provide access to abortion care. In 1982, Missouri had 29 abortion providers. Dr. McNicholas runs the last remaining one. The ability for our clinic here to provide care is really hanging by a thread. The state of Missouri has refused to renew the clinic's license over an alleged series of deficiencies. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. I do. Abortion has always been hard to provide in Missouri. Missouri is one of the most restricted states in, in this country. But over the last few years, it has gotten incredibly and exponentially more difficult. The number of hoops that patients have to jump through before they can even get through this door is astounding. If the court upholds the state's decision, Missouri would become the first state in America with no legal abortion clinic. We every year face attack after attack, both from our state legislator and now from our Department of Health. And that's not just a local narrative, that's across the, the whole country. Abortion is one of the most politically divisive subjects in America, and it's very much along partisan lines. Republican states are hostile to abortion, while Democratic states are pro-choice. But this political polarization is a peculiarly American phenomenon. In the rest of the world, abortion is legal on request or under a broad range of circumstances in 80 countries. In most of these countries, legalization has settled the debate, not stoked it. Take Britain. Abortion was legalized here in 1967, around the same time as America. Britain legalized abortion through a parliamentary act. So there was a long debate between MPs about the precise details of this. And that has largely settled it as a political issue in the country. Ireland, a religious country like America, only recently voted to legalize abortion. Here too, the debate has dropped off the political agenda. You had a substantial majority voting in favour of abortion in that public referendum. Two thirds of people supported it. That gave real legitimacy to the law that followed. So why didn't that happen in America? The answer partly lies in the way abortion was legalised in the Supreme Court. We'll hear arguments number 18, Roe against Wade. In the 1973 court case, Roe v. Wade, commonly known as Roe, nine judges ruled 7-2 to two that abortion is a constitutional right. In a landmark ruling, the Supreme Court today legalized abortions. The fact that it was a court decision rather than legislation means that you, you don't have democratic legitimacy. This wasn't a decision that people had sort of really come to as a country. You don't get um, the details that you would in legislation. And so it means that America's laws on abortion are actually some of the most permissive in the world. You can have abortions far later into pregnancy than you can in most other countries. That has really fueled the debate. Since that landmark case, public opinion has remained remarkably constant, with the majority saying abortion should be legal in certain cases. Yet politically, it has polarised, with both parties moving to the extremes. 
but it wasn't always this way. In the 70s, you could find pro-life and pro-choice people in both parties. And in fact, during the 1976 election, both presidential candidates tried very hard to distance themselves from any strong stand on abortion. If anything, Republicans were more pro-choice than Democrats. The main opponents to abortion immediately after Roe were Catholics, who tended to be Democrat. It wasn't at all inevitable that there would be any party alignment on abortion, much less the one we have now. The divide was partly engineered by Paul Weirich, a right-wing strategist who, in 1979, saw a political opportunity. Evangelicals made up 29% of the population. Abortion was his ticket to win their vote. Many of them had not been voting at all and had seen politics as sort of evil, corrupt, and to some extent largely irrelevant. Paul Weirich thought that evangelicals could bring elections home for Republicans. In 1980, Republican Ronald Reagan's presidential campaign capitalized on abortion. Despite previously signing into law the most liberal abortion bill in the country, he went on to switch his view and call for abortion to be banned. With regard to abortion, there's one individual who's not being considered at all. That's the one who's being aborted. It was a crucial factor in his win. He became the sort of standard bearer for the idea that the Republican Party should oppose abortion. This vote-winning formula has shaped Republican politics ever since. President Trump, too, has gone from being pro-choice... I'm very pro-choice. ...to a pro-life crusader. The baby is born, and then the doctor and the mother determine whether or not they will execute the baby. I don't think so. In the 2016 presidential election, Mr. Trump won 81% of the evangelical vote. President Trump has used some of the most extreme rhetoric we've seen on abortion. He's gone out of his way to reassure the anti-abortion movement. The fact that abortion is still at the heart of party politics in America means it matters more than ever to voters. 27% of Americans say a candidate must share their views on abortion. That's a third more than for the presidential election in 2016. Under Mr. Trump's administration, Republican states have ramped up their attack on abortion access. Nine states have passed so-called heartbeat bills that would ban abortions after six or eight weeks. But they all violate the rights granted in Roe versus Wade, so cannot be put into effect. If one of these bills makes it to the Supreme Court, however, everything could change. And that's what the pro-lifers passing them are counting on. Political tactics are also affecting women's access to abortion now. Since 2017, 35 Republican states have attempted to strangle abortion access, with more than 250 new regulations. In Missouri, women have an initial consultation, then have to wait 72 hours before returning for their abortion. For some, this means traveling 300 miles back and forth. It's a fact that Dr. McNicholas is keen to report in court. Most patients don't have the opportunity to come back in 72 hours. For most patients, it takes them at least a week and sometimes much longer as they, again, have to navigate many of the, the restrictions, the long drives and the figuring out um, gas and childcare and time off of work. If Missouri's last clinic closes, nearly 1.4 million women would be left without statewide abortion access. Patients would most likely have to cross from Republican Missouri into Democratic state Illinois, where protection for abortion has been signed into law. Now the political battle over abortion is literally being fought across state lines. Illinois knows where we stand, and we're going to be here for women if they have to be refugees from other states. Illinois has opened a new mega clinic just 10 minutes from the border to cater for the abortion demand from women in nearby Republican states. The reality is starkly different for patients who have the opportunity to get that care in a dignified manner when they decide they need it. It's one of several Democratic states creating legal frameworks to protect the right to abortion. Many of the bills you see now are states, both liberal and conservative, preparing for what many believe is a post row world. Uh, and many experts, myself included, think that that's a matter not of if, but of when. 
The fate of Roe rests on the Supreme Court, which is made up of nine justices, two of whom have been appointed by President Trump. The country has a new Supreme Court justice this morning. Brett Kavanaugh was sworn in overnight, ending in... He has nominated two justices to the Supreme Court who were chosen, I think, with the expectation that they would vote to overturn Roe. Legal abortion is in real peril in a way that hasn't been the case in literally probably 40 years. The newly composed Supreme Court will be deciding on its first abortion case by June 2020. All the signs are there that there would be more likely a significant scaling back of abortion rights. If that happens, you'll expect to see even more state restrictions that will be designed to encourage the court to overturn Roe. And you'll see the court probably begin down a path to the eventual overruling of Roe. If Roe is overturned, decisions about abortion will be handed back to the states meaning Republican states may ban abortions outright. We can see from other countries' experiences and from history that when women can't get safe legal abortions, it means that they get dangerous illegal ones and that they risk their fertility, their health and even their lives. Ultimately, it's these women, their bodies and their health that will pay the price for the politics of abortion. For me and for my colleagues who sit with patients every single day and hear story after story about why abortion is pivotal to their existence in that moment, it's not political at all.